Hello, um, welcome to day two of Advent of Code. Um, my name is Brian, and I posted my first ever video to YouTube yesterday, um, which is up on my YouTube site now, where I coded the first day of Advent of Code 2019 in Rust. Um, so if you happen on this video and haven't seen the earlier one, uh, you can go check this out to follow me from the beginning. But uh, today's uh, video is going to be a follow-up to touch on some things on day one and do day two. So with that, let's sort of jump into things. Uh, let's get in the environment I had set up yesterday. I have a TMUX session called AOC. Um, and I noticed watching the video again that my split pane, uh, since I moved my font up, sometimes I was running off the screen. So I, I made the window that we're going to look at code at uh, a little bit bigger um, this time. So today I made a little to-do list, which I will go over in a second. But before I do that, I just wanted to give a shout out to a couple of people. I posted uh, just an announcement of this video on the Rust uh, subreddit, and I had two sort of helpful comments. Um, one from uh, Moria Milo, who um, watched the video and gave some really good uh, comments and feedback. So. Um, he mentions that uh, towards the end of last uh, yesterday's video, we um, read all of the input into a vector of bytes um, because, uh, as it turns out, the way we've implemented this, we have to read um, that vector multiple times as we first time for part one, first time for part two. Um, and so he points out that this is all of our sort of code with buff readers is a little bit excessive because at the end of the day, we could have just read it into a VEC and did things easily that way. Um, and he's right about that, but I have a neat solution, so I'll be discussing sort of what to do about that uh, as we come to it. And the second comment he made, which is definitely true, is that I have a tendency in Rust to use imperative loop syntax as opposed to just taking advantage of Rust iterators and its sort of more functional features. Um, and that's true. I often, especially when I'm coding something live or coding something for the first time, my mind just kind of thinks in imperative style. Um, often I will go back and rewrite that in sort of a shorter, more terse way that uses Rust iterators and a more functional style. Um, and uh, anyway, so there's good stuff to talk about there. So really, thank you very much, uh, Morgan Milo, for the comment. It was fantastic. The second shout out I want to give is to they. Salon, who also made a video coding uh, day one of Advent of Code in Rust, um, which you can check out here. Um, so uh, here's the link, and then if you want to find this page in the comments, uh, it's in the Rust subreddit, and I made this post, Advent of Code in Rust day one. So um, with that, let's sort of look at the to-do list that I put together. So the first thing I want to do in this video, actually a lot of this video is going to be sort of talking about the day one uh, solution because and the infrastructure setup, because I think it's going to be really interesting. We'll also do day two's problem, but day two's problem, like day one's problem, is super easy. And really the first video was about sort of doing over and above what you need to do to just solve the problem. I really wanted to make a video on how, you know, if you had a real project and if you were being really fussy about everything, um, uh, what can you do in Rust to have proper error types and, um, you know, with the buff reader, which we'll get into, use the most efficient sort of way to do something possible, which is totally overkill and not necessary for solving that bit of code problems. Um, so again, the, the sort of focus of the first video and even this video is going to be more on just interesting things I've learned about Rust. Uh, when you want to build out like a serious library or a serious binary application, and it's sort of not about solving advent of code problems, which, quite frankly, I mean, I'll show you the solutions. You can you can do this in way less lines of code and way less infrastructure. Um, but I, I like the infrastructure part. That's kind of the point. I mean, just because I find it fun, so that's why I'm 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 over engineering these things. But anyway, we're going to make an improvement to the code uh, that's related to um, the comment about how. It's kind of sad that we're reading the input into a vector as opposed to just streaming it in and reading it line by line without allocating. Um, and then we're going to address the comment on sort of 
using not not taking advantage of Rust iterators and functional Rust. Finally, we'll add some tests to day one and push it to GitHub. GitHub. This is all stuff that you know I would have loved to have covered yesterday, but I ran out of time and I don't know what I'm doing with making videos. Uh, we can do day quickly, uh, get ready for day three, and then push to GitHub. So, with that is kind of the plan. Let us. Oh, what was the first to do item? Oh yeah, recap infrastructure setup. So, I kind of did that in the sense of giving you the philosophy of why we're being very, very verbose about things. And we've made our own custom error type, not because this is necessary here, you can just unwrap and panic, but because I think it's interesting to show how in Rust you can build out um, your own custom error type. And unfortunately, it's a little bit verbose in Rust uh, these days, but even uh, despite the verbosity, I think it's very intuitive and easy to do once you sort of get the hang of it. Um, so we built out our own custom error type, and if you remember from yesterday, we um, built out these very handy error and bail macros, which again, you sort of write once and then just copy into your projects. Um, I wrote them out from scratch, but I, I think they're really neat to have for error handling of your own custom error types. We also spent a bunch of time uh, fussing with our own custom reader type, and that was because in our main function, uh, we take as a command line argument um, an optional path buff. And the point is that we would like to be able to run our code uh, in two ways, just to add flexibility. And why you'd want to do this, I mean, you wouldn't. Uh, honestly, if you just want to solve the problem, you don't need to do any of this. But I think it's neat to sort of, again, over-engineer this to talk about how in Rust I would uh, if I needed to handle command lines in a very flex command line arguments in a very flexible way, how you do it? So we have AOC 2019 is the name of our binary. We give it a day, and then we give it we can optionally give it a path to the input file. So we can call our binary like this, and we can also call our binary if nobody supplies that second argument by um, catting the input file to standard in like this. And both of these ways will work. Um, but it produced uh, kind of a problem in that um, you know we're going to have different run functions for each day. And I still want them to take uh, a generic type that implements buff read. So we'll talk about that. But that means that we need to here, um, when we match on whether or not the user gave us an input or not, we need to get back something that we can pass into those functions and that that something needs to impl needs to be a concrete type that implements uh, IO buff read and the problem we were running into is that we can get a type that implements IO buff read here uh, in this match arm and we can get a type that implements IO buff read here in this match arm but they're not the same type and so rust will not let us sort of store them in the same variable. So we went through all of the shenanigans to create a wrapper type that basically just um, allows us to wrap those types and then have one single type. Oh, I should have deleted this. This is for the tests. Um, I sort of did a little bit of work after the last video, uh, but that should still all work. Let's see if our binary runs with that not in it. I also added a different binary, so we'll have to do this. And indeed, our binary runs. So, um, all right, let us address the issue of um, this sad, sad piece of code where added this too, but we don't need that. The sad type piece of code where we have to take the input and allocate a vector on the heap and read all the input in the vector into the vector um, as opposed to what I would like to do, which is just stream all those bytes in and allocate as little as possible, not because it really this code really needs to be efficient, but again, it's just interesting to examine how you know one would do this if you had to be really efficient. So we do that because we're going to um, run over the um, lines of the input a first time uh, in order to get answer to part one and run over the answer or run over the lines of the input in part two to get the answer to part two. 
Um, but uh, the obvious thing sort of occurred to me is we don't need to run over the data twice. Just let's once we when we run over the data once, let's calculate both the answer to part one and to part two, and then we won't need to turn this into we won't need to allocate anything on the heap. We can just do this completely in a streaming fashion. Um, so we don't need that. Uh, we don't need part one and part two because we're going to collapse them into the same thing. Um, and we don't need a reader anymore. We can just pass in input, which is no longer going to need to take this. In fact, we don't need we don't need a run part function anymore at all. We don't need to take a function as a parameter. Hopefully you guys will see all where this is going eventually. We can move this back to being our normal run function with the run signature that we're going to use for every day that's the same. And we can get rid of this. Um, so at the end here, we don't want to return a size. We just want to print out our answer. So we'll print line total. Return unit. Oops. Return unit. Okay. Um, so uh, we still need to loop through the input once, but I mean, here's sort of the obvious thing to do is when we get for each line, we parse out an integer, and once we have that integer, we just need to call part one on the integer to get back oh well, here we need a total one and a total two and we will just take total one and increment it by calling the part one function and we will take total two and increment it by calling the part two function on that same input and at the end, we'll have both total one and total two. So we can print them both out. And this needs a semicolon. And now that should just work. Um, this needs to be public because we're calling it from our main function. And so now um, we have successfully avoided having to read the input into memory. Uh, into a big byte of memory allocated on the heap. We are essentially streaming the input data in and processing it as we go. And the only allocation we need to make is we need to create this small buffer, uh, which will only grow big enough to hold one line of data at a time. Um, which I think is uh, rather efficient. Um, it's certainly more efficient than what we were doing before, and as I'll talk about later, it's also more efficient than using um, using the lines iterator, uh, which is uh, something that you can get on a buffer reader. I'll talk about that in, that in a second. So let's make sure this still works. We do indeed get the same answers as before, um, and so we've made a small improvement to our code. Um, one quick thing about the comment of not using lines. So another way to write this would be to say input.lines. Um, let's go to the documentation to talk about this. So on buff read, there is a method called lines. And it returns a lines iterator. Um, so the iterator returns this, this function will yield an IO result of string and each string returned will not have an, the new line at the end, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you could write this code. You could say for results in input.lines, let line equals result question uh, mark, and then do the rest of the stuff. So we could do this. For we're not working on the buffer, we're working on the line. I don't think we need to trim it, but let's trim it just in case, and we wouldn't need that there. And this 
code would be replaced by that, and I think it should still work. As indeed it does. But the reason why I prefer this sort of loopy, uh, more verbose um, syntax uh, in this particular case, um, well, if you don't care, if you're just doing something simple and you don't care about performance or efficiency, this is fine. It, it's actually great. It's, I mean, Rust is a super fast language no matter what you're allocating. But what happens here is a new string is allocated every time we, uh, every time we run through this for loop. Um, whereas in this code, we allocate one string up front um, and we clear it at the end of each loop and we keep reusing it. Um, so there's only one allocation in this version of the code and there is uh, many, many allocations, one for each line in this version of the code. So that kind of reminded me why I instinctively go to this loop syntax instead of writing, instead of using the lines iterator. Although the lines iterator is very convenient and you know, you can do all the fun stuff with lines iterator on top of this. So you could say, instead of a for loop, you could say for each, uh, well, you could say, well, we'll, we'll get into that. I, I have some code where I talk more about iterators and handling errors. Um, so that's all I wanted to cover on the small improvement to um, day one. And indeed, uh, we still have a running code. The second thing I wanted to cover, I think, is an aside on iterators and functional Rust. So I made this uh, sort of aside binary, iterator, iterator aside, which I'll just run real quick. Uh, cargo run dash dash bin iterator aside. And it uh, essentially gives us the right answer, uh, and it does it in three ways. Um, so the first way is the way that if you, you know, if you want to just get the answer really quick and do this fast and, and sort of not worry about it in the smallest amount of code possible, this is sort of what I would write uh, using iterators and functional Rust. Um, but we're going to not handle errors. Um, and uh, iterators are really good when you can just unwrap errors and you don't have to deal with errors. The problem is you'll see when we look at sort of version two um, and finally version three is that it gets a little hairy once you have to worry about errors. But let's just go over uh, attempt number one. So here I'm just I'm just reading the input from the file, um, uh, getting a reader, but you know our main function takes care of that for us. But this is a standalone binary, so we're just going to read it in, right? Um, or read it in streaming still because we got an IO buff reader over a file. Um, but anyway, uh, so on that input, uh, you can call lines as I mentioned. That returns an IO result of uh, a string. And so just map that result and unwrap it. So now on the next call to map here, this is going to be the, line, the string line. So trim it, parse it, unwrap that because we're not worried about errors. So now we have an iterator that is going to give us the um, uh, each line parsed into a number, and then we call fold. And the way fold works is you give it your sort of initial state, you give it, uh, and then you give it a closure. That closure on each other each iterator of the loop, the accumulator will be the current state, um, and in is the next value. And then you're just asked to return what you want the accumulator to be updated to. So um, because we're sort of solving both problems at the same time, I have the initial state uh, sort of set to zero for the part one answer and zero for the part two answer. And then we return this tuple here. Um, and all the tuple does is it takes the um, current running total for the um, part one, and it adds what we're supposed to add for part one, and it takes the current running total of part two, and it adds what we're supposed to add for part two, and these helper functions down here, fuel one and fuel two, should be familiar to you, they're the exact same helper functions we used before. So fuel one just takes n, divides by three, um, subtracts two, and if, it's, if there's an underflow, um, then it, it, it unwraps that and returns zero instead. And fuel two is just sort of doing that recursively. 
Although we're, we're not doing it recursively, we're using a for loop, but the idea is to, I mean, you could write this in recursive code. I should probably talk about that at some point too, but uh, Rust doesn't have, uh, what's it called, tail, uh, tail call optimization, or something like that. So it means that there's a slight chance that if you write actual recursive code, it overflows your stack. Usually the compiler is smart enough to avoid that, and it certainly would in this case. But because Rust is not 100% perfect on this, like say Haskell is, I generally, if I can, try to write recursive code in an imperative loop style manner that doesn't actually recursively call the function. Um, but, all right, so that's attempt number one, and it's super terse. I mean, the, the, entire, the entire program that I wrote for you yesterday could be just one file with nothing but this in it. And you wouldn't even need your own error type because we're just panicking everywhere if we run into a, um, an error. So that's like a simple, quick, easy solution. I'm sure people could get it even smaller, but that, that's sort of what I came up with using iterators. The problem here is when we want to handle errors. So the first attempt I use to handle errors uh, is kind of cheating because I basically create this sort of outside variable called error, initialize it to OK, so we uh, have our input, we call the lines method on it, which returns an iterator over IO results of lines. Um, we take that, for each IO result we get, let's map it into our error type. Now we have our error type result. Um, and then we take that, and if it's OK, um, we get the string that it returns us. We trim it and parse it into U size and map that error to our error type. So we this closure needs to take in uh, a string and return a result of uh, U size, which we do. And then we filter map that result. So um, for each result we get back, um, and here's the little sort of trick. This is what I meant with handle errors with outside variable captured by closure. closure. Um, we want to uh, end up sort of doing away with all the errors. So if we get OK, um, it's going to pass through the filter. If we don't get OK, we get an error, then I'm setting this, um, this outside variable to the error and then returning none, which means after this filter, like we will no longer, any, anything that errors will no longer be in our iterator after this filter map. Um, but we still know because of this that we got an error, so down here we can check it. Um, so then when we call fold, this fold uh, doesn't have to deal with errors at all. It's the same exact fold as we had up here when we were just unwrapping because um, we, uh, we know now that we don't have results. We have actual um, OK variants, and we can just use this same fold. The hard part, the even harder part, is when you sort of say, I know I want to be very functional in Rust and with errors and use iterators, and I am not going to allow myself to have this outside variable that's captured by the closure, closure and then checked at the end. Um, so this took me like a good, I don't know, five minutes of, five to 10 minutes of really fussing to get this to compile. Um, but here we take the input, we, um, uh, get a lines iterator, we map over it, um, and we turn the results, the IO result into our result type. Then we take our result type and we uh, turn it into a result of uh, a U size. So we, we parse and all this stuff. Um, but what comes out at the end of this call to map is we're going to end up with a result. And now we fold. Uh, but we fold in a weird way. <laughs> so we want to, we want to, um, our initial state is going to be, we're going to say we're, we, we're okay and we've got our sort of tuple of totals that we're keeping. And then, so that means our accumulator is a result. So we should call and then on it, which will get us the actual um, running totals, which I've called A and B inside this closure. And then in is also going to be a result um, because that's what after we call this map, we're, we're getting results. Um, so we match on that. If it's OK, then we return uh, from that closure 
uh, the okay of um, what our new accumulator should be updated to. Uh, this is all very, it's hard to talk about code. Um, it's much easier to sort of write it than it is to talk about it. Um, and uh, and if we error, we keep the error. So um, basically, the, at the end of this, this type will be end up being a uh, an iterator that returns results. Oh no! It's, it, because we fold, we fold it all down into one value. So this will be a result of a tuple of u sizes or um, an error. And so we call question mark on that, and then we have our answer. Um, but uh, as you can see, I was sort of reminded when I did this why I use a lot of the imperative style sometimes, especially when I'm trying to handle errors, is that you can't, uh, you can't just call question mark willy-nilly in these closures, because that doesn't propagate the, that doesn't return the error from the wider function, which is what you usually want. That returns the error, uh, inside this closure. And map, uh, for example, map cannot return a result. It has to return, um, uh, well, I guess it could return. In any case, I, I'm not explaining this well, but hopefully going through all this code will explain to you why I find it somewhat confusing sometimes, especially when you have to deal with things like fold. Um, to uh, do this in a completely functional style, even though Rust allows you to do that. Um, and so instead of doing it that way, we opted for, oops, let's go back to day one, the super imperative loop where we just do everything C style, <laughs> um, which, which also works. And has the added benefit, again, I just sort of remind everybody, has the added benefit that we only have to allocate this string once as opposed to allocating a string for every iteration of the for loop, uh, which is what happens when you call the lines method and get a lines iterator, as opposed to doing it this way. So I think that is all I wanted to say about day one. Oh, no, we gotta add some tests to day one. So let us quickly add tests because Gosh, these videos, like the time just goes. Uh, I'm sure you guys are already bored, um, but I'd rather make a longer video and sort of talk about everything I want than do something quickly. Hopefully that doesn't turn people off from watching uh, the video. So in our day one uh, module, let's add a test module and use super um, and write a test that tests uh, day one. All right, so for this, uh, we need to go back and uh, use super, there we go. Uh, we need to go back to the advent of code website, which I forgot to pull up, and look at the small little test cases they give us. Um, so for part one, here are all the test cases, and for part two, here are all the test cases. So let's just quickly sort of code those up. So we know that we have a bunch of test cases. We have uh, test cases. Let's make this a slice of tuples. And let's see, let's make them input one. Oh, I wanted to do this. Input one expected one, input two, expected. Uh, actually, I think the inputs are the same for part one and part two. So we'll do the input, that's a test input, and what we expect for part one, and what we expect for part two. So um, off of memory, this is gonna be 12 as an input, it needs to give us two, and it needs to give us two. Um, 14 is an input, needs to give us two, also needs to give us two. And then the other one is 1969, 1969 needs to give us 654 in the first case, and I don't know yet in the second case, and 10756 needs to give us 33583 in the first case, and we don't know yet in the second case. Oops. 
Um, so in the second case, uh, let's see, 1969 needs to give us 966. And the very large number needs to give us 50,346. 50,346. Uh, okay, so now we have some test cases, and let's just say for uh, input expected, expected one, expected two, in test cases, we want to run our function, which is called run. Oh, to test these, we might have to have uh, we might have to do this. Uh, what should I call? It? We we need to have this return a result. Uh, what should I call this? I should call it. Um, uh, uh, this is a terrible name. Run to, and it will instead of printing out the answers, it will return a tuple of answers. So let's just return here total total one and total two. And now that's fine. But we need to replace we need our our run function that we call from main. Which returns a result of unit. And here we will just call run two with our input. This no longer needs to be mutable. Uh, we will propagate the error if we have any. This will give us back a tuple, or well, it'll give us back answer one and answer two. And let's print line answer uh, answer one and print line answer two and return okay. So I think that will, everything will still work there. Let's try. Yes, our program still works. Um, so we want to call run2 to, run to on input. Well, it's we need to call it on a reader, which I will get to in a second. Let's unwrap that. That'll give us actual one and actual two and we want to assert that expected expected one is equal to actual one and we want to assert that expected two is equal to actual two and when we sort of do this iteration these are going to be references to u sizes as opposed to u sizes so let's dereference those, and I think I misspelled actual. Oh, and we need to say let. There we go. But we don't have a reader. Um, we have strings. Um, and so that's where our sort of handy-dandy reader type um, well, we could just create. I mean, we don't need to. We don't need to pass in our reader type. Um, we can just. Uh, what day am I on? There we go. We can just wrap uh, the input in an IO buff reader new input as bytes because you can make an an IO buff reader can wrap a slice of U8s. Um, so I think this should work. Let's run it. Cargo test. And indeed it passes. So we've successfully added all of the test cases, which is something you should probably do in the beginning of doing advent of code. Um, but uh, it's not, I mean, we know we got the right answer, but it's sort of nice to show off the way Rust allows you to write inline tests just like this in your modules. And it's super easy. All right, so that covers everything with day one.
so or my day two video has been mostly about day one. Um, but let's push everything to GitHub because I didn't do that yesterday. And I guess I will show off how to use GitHub. Um, so, uh, which uh, you guys, if you're watching this, you probably know, but there was a time in which I was watching Cody videos and I had no idea how to push to GitHub or make a project. And so I'm going to go through it uh, sort of from the beginning. And so here's my sort of main GitHub page. And let's create a new repository called AOC 2019. Um, and we'll say advent of code in Rust, advent of code 2019 in Rust. We'll make it public. Uh, let's not worry about a readme right now. And we'll create the repository. So now that we've created the repository, um, first of all, let's get that to do out of here. I want to keep it around, but I don't want it committed to GitHub. Um, and run a git status. So we haven't done anything yet. Um, and so uh, this is probably right for what we want to commit for our first commit. Um, let's, just for good measure, let's run the test one more time. And let's run the uh, oh, the thing. Another thing I don't want to commit is this binary folder is not really necessary anymore because I just wanted to use it to talk through things. Um, uh, do I want to delete it or just copy it somewhere? So let's move uh, uh, source bin to my home folder. Well, hold on. Let's make foo in my home folder or let's make a let's make this and let's make uh, I think I have a foo folder we'll call bar in my lib folder and then we'll move um, uh, source bin to lib bar now it should be gone but I have not deleted it uh, awesome so uh, does our binary still run it runs. Do our tests still pass? They pass. Okay, git status. Oops, git status. So now I think this is everything we sort of want to commit. So let's git add all. Uh, let's git commit uh, m. Uh, we'll say initial commit day one. And I sign all of my git commits, so this is my gpg key, which you don't need. Um, I probably don't even need. But now that we've done that, let's add our remote origin and push. Um, all right, so if we do git status now, we are up to date with master, and if we refresh this page, we should have a nice little repository. But the one thing this repository is missing is a readme, um, which we can add real quick. Uh, add event of code 2019 in Rust. And it's also missing licenses. So let me copy those from another project that I have. Uh, wallpaper license. I want both the MIT and the Apache license because, I mean, I actually have no idea what license to do. I just know that this is what Rust uses, so I use it too. So let's copy those here. So now they're in here, and let's make sure they're up to date. So the Apache license is indeed copyright 2019, and the MIT license is indeed copyright 2019. And so let's get status on this stuff. We've added three files, get add all, get commit m. Uh, add licenses and read me and oops so I gotta sign my commit and let's get push and so now we should have a license and a readme nice um, so that is day one all done, done and dusted it only took uh, like several hours <laughs> explaining things which again I mean you could do this project in like five minutes um, but the point of this stream the point of these videos is more to talk about um, how to uh, do rust in a way that 
sort of really takes advantage of the fact that it is a super low level programming language and trying to make something super polished, even though it's overkill and completely unnecessary and over-engineered for these problems, I think it'll be useful for people who are interested in learning, like how do I make a library? How do I do it efficiently? How do I do an error type? Things like that. So again, the point is really not solving. I mean, the point is to, you can take the point for what it was, what it is. I don't know. Maybe this is not useful to anybody. Um, but we're done. So let's look at our readme and we're ready to do day two. So let's actually do day two. I'll try and do it rather quickly um, because we got all the infrastructure set up. I mean, a lot of the first, uh, a lot of what we did in the beginning was to set up all this sort of unnecessarily robust infrastructure. But now that we have it, let's just take advantage of it. Um, so let's look at day two of advent code. Um, and this is a neat little problem. I will try and summarize it. Um, so basically, you're getting, I'll, I'll look at the input and explain the input. So here's the input, which, why don't we just bring it into a file already. So neovim uh, data 02.txt, and we'll paste all of that stuff in there, um, and let's cat it. Okay. Um, by the way, I have um, cat is alias to a cool program that's written in Rust called bat. <laughs> so it's just a newer, I guess, more improved version of bat, and you can get it by cargo install uh, bat, I think. Um, and then I alias it to cat, and it, it prints things prettier and nicer um, than cat does. So... Uh, this is essentially um, a memory bank for a computer. Um, in fact, it's it's if you think it's like the ROM, the read-only memory of a program that you feed into a computer. And the way this computer works is, it's going to uh, look at the first uh, first uh, number, um, which is actually not going to be a byte. It's going to have to be um, bigger than that. I use U size, and that works. But so it looks at the first U size. And it says, this is my instruction. If it's a one, then we take the next two numbers and we add them together. Actually, we take the, we, <laughs> we take the numbers that are at the offset zero and the number that's at the offset zero, and we add those together, and then we write it to the slot that is at offset three. And then we have done all of this instruction, and we move on to the next one, and we look at this uh, U size, which also encodes an instruction. So again, it's going to be add because it's the instruction one. So we're going to find whatever is at slot one and whatever is at slot two. We're going to add them together, and we're going to store them in slot three. And then eventually, you see, we keep going for along like this, and eventually we're going to run into a two. So the two instruction is the same thing, except for instead of adding, you multiply. And then the last valid instruction type is hidden somewhere here. So here it is, is 99. And 99 is the instruction for halt and end the program. Um, there are a couple interesting uh, other things to note about the problem, which is that these zeros here are not meant to stay zeros. So you're meant to load this program and you give it input, and you give it two numbers as input. The first input goes here. It's called the noun in the problem. The second input goes here. It's called the verb. And then you run the program, and whatever ends up in the zero slot of this memory bank is the output of the program. So, I mean, if you can't tell already, right, like as we run through this program, it's gonna mutate all of this sort of internal memory and state in various funky ways that we don't really need to worry about. But at some point, it's going to change this either once or multiple times, and that's the output. So uh, hopefully that explained the problem. Um, and what we're asked in part one is once we have a working computer that does what I just explained, um, we need to, before running the program, uh, replace position 1 with the value 12, so put 12 in our noun spot, and replace position 2 with the value 2, put 2 in our verb spot, then run the program, and then see what the value at position 0 is. So let's code this up. Oops, what did I just do? 
get out of that. Okay, get out of that. Uh, did I mess anything up? No. Okay. Let's go to day two and start cutting this up quickly, quickly, quickly. Got to take less time, Brian. So let's make a struct um, that represents our computer. Our computer is, I've decided, going to have a ROM, uh, read-only memory, which is a vec of U8s, or no, U sizes. And it's going to have RAM, which is a vec of U size as well. And it's going to have a program counter, which is a U size. And we will initialize this computer in the following way. Um, let's impl computer. And we'll say function new. And you need to give it the ROM, uh, which we will take in as a reader because that's how we'll have it from the ROM function. Uh, so let's make it, let's make this a IO buff, a type that implements IO buff read. Um, and this is going to return us, I think maybe a result, but we'll see. It's going to return us self for now. Unimplement. So this is how I want to structure the uh, computer. So let's read in the uh, ROM from our ROM reader. So we need to uh, turn it, here we actually do need to turn it into, we need to allocate a vector on the heap and turn it into, um, we need to allocate a vector on the heap and read all the bytes in. Um, so uh, we won't be able to do this streaming. So let's say content is, well, let's call these, well, these aren't bytes, so they're content. This needs to be mutable. Let's allocate a new vector. Let us take our ROM reader and read to end into the new vector. And now we can create our computer, which has the ROM is our content. Actually, yeah, let's, instead of calling it content, let's call this ROM. Um, oh, this can fail. I don't, oh yeah, it can fail. So that's where we want to return a result of our error type. So we, we have error up there. Um, so this is going to need to return a result of computer. And our RAM, uh, let's just initialize it to nothing. Um, you could, with an option, well, anyway, you could avoid that allocation. And let's take our program counter to, let's initialize our program counter to zero. And I'm pretty sure this will give us a new, oh, our input, <laughs> I'm sorry, our input is, um, our input is still a, uh, like a, a reader, so we're reading in bytes. That's not what we want. <laughs> That's not what we want at all. Um, we want to do our fancy let buffer equals string new and do a loop and if rom reader dot read line into the buffer ever equals zero we're at the end of the file and we can break otherwise we um, oh no we don't have a we uh, sorry, gosh. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so remember our input <laughs> for this one looks like uh, looks like this. So it's all on one line and it's separated by commas. It's not separated by new lines anymore. So we don't need to do that. What we need to do is let us um, let's make this. Buffer a string, and let's take the ROM reader and read to string the buffer, and this can fail. Um, and so now we have a string that just includes all of our data, and we want to take that buffer and split on commas, um, and then we want to 
want to uh, map all of the strings that we just got back. Here I'm using function rust. Um, and we want to parse those into a u size, which can return an error. And so when we collect this into a vector, we're actually going to collect it into a result of a vector of u size and our error. Um, and that is going to return us our wrong. And I think it's going to yell at us because, oh, and this the, this will return results, so we need to propagate that. But this is going to yell at us because this uh, function returns a result of the standard num parse error, and so we can just say, okay, um, unwrap that, and like that. And we're not allowed to borrow ROM reader as mutable, so this needs to be mutable. And good. Now we've got a computer. So we've got a computer. Now let us sort of execute the program, which is going to take a mutable reference to self and return our answer, which is a U size. And it's probably going to return a result of the U size but I'm not quite sure yet. So let's have it return, okay, 42. So now, um, let's implement this in a second, um, but just get the program running so that we can, uh, we can run it on the command line. So let's say let mute computer equals computer new, pass in our reader, um, which does not need to be underscored anymore. Propagate that error, and let's say computer.execute, and that's going to return us oh, a result, and it's going to be the answer. Um, and we will print line answer, answer. And then we return OK. So right now, this should return us uh, 42 if we run it on the command line. Oops, no, go over there. There we go. Let's open this back up. So day two. So if we do uh, cargo run and pass it day two and data two as an input, we should get invalid digit found in string. Uh, maybe we need to trim this first. There we go. Um, there must have been some white space um, that was preventing the parsing of the integer. Okay, uh, so now we have uh, we can run it and see what this outputs. So the first thing we want to do is we want to well, actually execute is going to take a noun, uh, which is u size, and a verb, which is u size. And that's our input. Uh, so we go back up here, and for part one, they want us to put in uh, twelve and two. So let's run it with 12 and 2. Um, OK. So the first thing we want to do is we want to copy over our um, program from ROM into RAM. Uh, this is necessary uh, because in the second part of the problem, we're going to have to run this computer over and over again with different inputs. And so we need to keep the initial program around uh, because the program is going to mutate the RAM. Um, but when we reset everything and run the program again, we need the RAM to be reset to what it was initially. And so that means we have to clone it and sort of keep it around. Um, and we also need to set the first um, position of our memory to the noun. And we 
we need to set the second position of our memory to the verb. Oh, and here, uh, because I'm running out of time, I'm not going to be very careful about checking whether or not we have the correct input. Uh, in term whether or not, you know, like if we got, if the input that we gave us was like, you know, ended up being uh, a vector of just like two numbers, then this right here would uh, go out of bounds and fail um, and panic. Um, but I'm not going to worry about that. Um, let's see. Stop yelling at me. I'm going to return 42 for now. Um, okay, we cannot borrow things as mutable because, of course, execute has to take a mutable reference to self because we're changing self. Um, all right, so what we want to do is we want to, uh, in a loop, um, match on self.pc. Oh, self.pc is the first um, thing that we have in RAM, right? It's the first position. So we initialize that there. Uh, or no, 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 self.pc self is zero. Sorry. The opcode is self dot, or the self dot RAM at the position of the program counter, which is at zero. Right. So we want to match on the opcode that we get. And if it is a one, we do some things. And in fact, we can do this. If it's a two, they're very similar. So we'll do some things. Unimplemented. Um, if it's 99, we will do, we will halt. So we'll break from the loop. And if it's anything else, we are going to say, this is an error of um, invalid uh, opcode. Opcode. Because we made the nice bail macro, we can do that easily. Um, and then what we want to return in the end is OK of whatever is in memory at self dot ram position zero. So if we run this, it's obviously going to panic, um, but uh, we at least have the beginnings of a solution. So yeah, it panicked and not yet implemented because we don't know what to do when we run into an add or multiply opcode. So this is fairly easy. Um, we take uh, the memory at the program counter plus one, so self.ram, self.pc plus one, and that is the a pointer to our first operand, so let's call it the A pointer. Uh, we need to get the B pointer, which is from where our program counter is plus two, we need to get the W pointer, so I'm gonna, that's where we're going to write things out to, to at self.ram, self.pc plus three. Um, we need to do a bunch of stuff, and eventually we'll have to increment the program counter by four. Um, this is uh, usually, uh, this is, we're obviously making a, like an emulator, right? And most of the time in real computers, like the length the number of operands that an opcode takes will be variable. And so you won't be able to just, no matter what happens, increment the program counter by a fixed amount. But here, um, we know that if we have, we only have two instructions, add or multiply, and they both take uh, sort of three operands. And so we know that every time we execute an instruction, we're going to be dealing with four numbers, and we just go to the next four to run the next instruction, which is helpful. Um, Again, there's all kinds of error checking that we should be doing to make sure that the input is not like messed up, but I'm just going to ignore that because I know the input is not messed up, at least in this case. Um, so uh, now we need to get A. So A is in our RAM, uh, wherever, uh, in the spot of A pointer, right? And B is in our RAM at the spot of B pointer. And now we need to write to our RAM at W pointer spot the um, either 
either the sum of a and b or the uh, or the result of multiplying a and b, and we can just check if opcode equals one, then we want to write a plus b. Otherwise, because this is the only other possibility, we want to write a times b, um, and we increment the program counter, and this should just work. Uh, let's see. Index out of bounds. So it didn't work. Let's see. So initially the program counter is at zero. So this is going to be one, two, and three. And in our RAM at that spot should be the spot we go to next, or the spot we go to to actually get the operands. B pointer, it's not that RAM, W pointer. A plus B, A times B. Self.pc plus equals four. And then we loop again. Oh, we're not changing our opcode. So the opcode needs to come in here. Um, there we go. And the answer is that we get is three two six seven seven four zero, which I believe is the right answer. Yep. Um, perfect. All right. The second part is actually uh, super simple. Well, it's actually a really really hard problem that I haven't seen really anybody solve. If you want to like solve it explicitly. But it's a really easy program if you just brute force it. And that's what sort of, I, I mean, I solved this by myself, but then I've, it's now December 3rd, so I've seen other solutions. And like every solution I've seen is people just saying, let's brute force it. Um, so it basically says the, the answer to number two, uh, do we reset the state on execute? We, so we reset the state on execute, so we can just reuse our computer again. But the problem for number two is you say, um, well, how do I put this? Actually, let's go read it. So um, the uh, okay, so we need to find the input. So uh, we need to pick a noun and pick a verb that will cause the program to output this particular number. <laughs> um, and oh, the noun and the verb can only be it's written somewhere, or between the values 0, 0, 0 and 99 inclusive. So that basically the noun has 100 possibilities, the verb has 100 possibilities. So if I can do math, that means we only need to search through at most uh, 10,000 possibilities. So we need to run this program at most 10,000 times, and whichever sort of combination of noun and verb ends up outputting this is the answer. And then once we have those nouns and verbs, we just do this to get a unique simple number. We take uh, the noun that worked for this answer multiplied by 100, and we add the verb that worked for this answer, and that's the answer to the problem. So we need to say, we need this number around. Oops, because we're going to use it. And um, we can just say, for i, for noun in 0 to 100, or 99 inclusive, and for verb in 0 to 99 inclusive, let us take our computer and execute the program with um, this noun and this verb. And that is going to give us an answer. And if that answer equals this number here, then we have found what we want, and so we will say um, we'll say we're looking for an answer which starts out as none, and if we find it, we will say the answer is um, the sum tuple of noun. Well, I guess we can do a hundred times noun plus verb here. Um, and this needs to be mutable, and this needs to be sum, and 
And actually, let's initialize this to an error of error um, invalid input unable to find noun verb combination which that outputs one nine six nine zero seven two zero period and so now this can just be okay and we can return answer Oops. Um, or well we can we're not returning from run function so we still return okay but we um, print line the unwrapping of that answer well um, and this should uh, give us the answer to number two uh oh invalid input so did I copy the number correctly one nine six nine zero seven two zero one nine six nine zero seven two zero uh, we indeed are looping over all the possible inputs and outputs. This should return the answer, which it does. We never find this. Wait, why are we running it twice? But does it give us... Where are we printing things? Let's just print that there and forget about this stuff for a second. See what that gives us. So it did not find it. Um, why did it not find it? So every time we do an execution of our computer, have I used ROM anywhere? ROM? So we keep the old ROM around, and we, we initialize the memory every time we execute. We also put the noun and the verb in like we're supposed to. And then we uh, execute the program, and we return what's at the first position. Um, So we know the answer is 7870, so let's just see what happens if we put that into our computer. see what the input is that we're getting um, um, so where is a copy of our input data 02 so we it looks like we're reading the memory in correctly, right? We start out with 100311, 100311. We end with 9920140. Okay. 
Um, so let's make sure that. Sorry, yeah, I I don't know what's wrong with this, so you're gonna have to watch me live debug on on stream, which is always uncomfortable, or like on a video. Uh, let's print line self dot ram here, and we will do this just twice or three times. Well, that's too many, even. So, indeed, our RAM looks like it starts out at the beginning correctly. Oh, uh, we don't reset the program counter to zero. So here, we need to set the program counter to zero. Um, well, we don't initialize it to zero ever. So let's do it. Let's just always at the beginning initialize it to zero. And I think that's our problem. Is we were running through this, we were running through this execute loop, and it was mutating the program counter. Um, but when we tried to start it again, we need to reset it back to zero. Obviously. So now let's see if this works. Oh, we don't need to be printing. Oh yeah. Uh, and it still doesn't work. We still didn't find what we were looking for. Uh, oh, because we're not looping enough now. 99, 99. Okay. So this should, where else am I printing things? I don't want to print you here. You're fine. Um, so now let's run it again. And indeed, we get 7880, which is the right answer. And so let's go back and put in our error again. Let mute answer equals error of error uh, invalid invalid input um, unable to find noun verb combination that outputs 196. Nine zero seven two zero. Period. So that is our answer, unless we overwrite it by finding something. Uh, and what we want to overwrite it with is OK of a hundred times noun plus verb, and then down here we will print out our answer if it is in the OK case. And that indeed prints what we want. So um, that is day two solved. Um, we could add test cases to it. Um, how am I doing on time? Oh, well, we've only, we're not at the hour and 30 minute mark, which is when I arbitrarily decided to cut off last time. So why don't we try and add the test cases? Oh, okay. Uh, which again, we probably should do in the beginning. I mean, test-driven development, right? But I, I just like diving in. Um, use super star. Um, create a test here, and we'll test day two. How did I name the tests in the first module? I named it like that. Good. Um, and we'll create a computer. Which will have to take a reader. Um, and we need some test cases. And we need to computer.execute something noun verb dot unwrap but it, uh, actual equals all right how do we test this so going back up to the beginning um, suppose you have the following program all right that seems like a test case so let's make uh, 
this be a test program. For the purposes of the illustration, here are some here's it split on different lines. The first four integers are blah blah blah, blah blah blah, blah blah blah, blah blah, uh, blah blah blah. Step four, blah blah blah. So multiplying these positions, sort of position zero, stepping four forward more, halting the program, here the initial first states. Um, so I guess we could test for this one. We could test that the memory at the end ends up looking entirely like this. So this is input uh, RAM or expected RAM. So let's do this one case. So we have a computer. Uh, oh, do we start on? Oh, these are initial final states of a few more small programs. Um, so let's not do that one. Let's just do these four small programs. All right. This one becomes this. This one becomes, or this one becomes this. Uh, this one becomes this. And this one becomes. this. Forget about the first one. Okay, so there are test cases. So for input expected RAM in test cases, uh, I guess we only need one, or no, we have to initialize the computer with the right program. So we need a reader we need a reader, so we can just say let reader equals IO buff reader new of input as bytes. Um, so we get a new computer, and then we computer dot execute. Uh, Well, I guess we have to type in, we need the noun and the verb too. Um, so for here, it's zero, zero. For here, it's three, zero. For here, it's four, four. And for here, it's one, one. So uh, now, noun, noun verb and we'll say noun verb remember these these are going to be references to u size or references to a generic in integer type um, why is there no how do I spell execute execute no method name execute all on a result because the constructor for a computer can return a result um, all right, so this is our, well, we don't care about the result of our program. Uh, what we care about is the contents of the memory. So let actual RAM equals um, computer.ram and we need to fold or iter and we need to fold that we'll start with a new string and uh, s 
type in, we will um, take our string. This is not correct, but we'll push a stir on there, and that stir will be format of in, and then we'll return s. And this is going to have to be mutable. Um, oh, format. What are you yelling at me now for? What's the signature fold? Not trifold, just fold. Um, initial state, comma, closure. Initial state, comma, closure. All right, let's see what this is actually saying. Oh, it's because we forgot some Michael in there. Okay, let's move this back over. Um, Okay, so we have an unused variable, which is actual RAM. This is not going to work, by the way, because we need commas. Um, well, instead of creating the output as a string, let's just do let's just do this instead. Let's say let expected RAM equals expected RAM dot split comma. Uh, dot map. It's going to give us a string. Let's trim the string. Let's parse it into a U size and unwrap that and collect this into a vector of U size. So now expected RAM is a vector of U size. Except I messed up somewhere. Split. Oh. Uh, no, split works. Expected RAM is a string. Map s, s trim, parse, u size, unwrap. Collect, oh, collect, like that. So now we just need to say assert equals um, computer.ram uh, expected RAM. And that should work. So let's run uh, cargo test. And indeed, it passes. Um, so there are the tests. Oh, and this is expected RAM, noun, verb. Um, so here are the tests for um, day two. I don't think there, I don't think there are separate tests for part two. No, they're not separate tests for part two, obviously. Um, and that's it. So I think uh, with day two done and dusted, we'll just set up day three. So add day three dot rs. And we know that like day one and day two, um, we, need, we need this stuff. We're gonna say unimplemented. And that is day three function, and we just need to make sure we have a day three module. And in our main function, we can say, if you give me a three, then I will call day three's run function. I guess the other thing that we can do, so I don't forget to do it next time, is we can put configure tests, mod tests, use 
super star. Well, it's going to import unused, so we'll put that in later. Function test 03, and just do that. And unused variable input, we don't want any warnings about unused variables, so let's do it with that. And cargo test. Good. And cargo, let's do cargo, but let's do, try everything. Cargo build and um, let's take the data from 01.txt and pipe it in over standard input to uh, cargo target dir debug AOC 2019 and pass it one. Oh, something just happens with my target directory. Let's get rid of it. Be careful that I'm doing this correctly. Yes, I can delete that. I own it. I control it. Delete it. Okay, so now let's run this again. Oh, compiling. Compiling and running OBS at the same time. It's probably sad. My computer is actually pretty good, though. I have a I have a X1 uh, Extreme ThinkPad. What? Why is permission denied? permissions on data. I can read them, I can write them. Oh, obviously. <laughs> we need to cat this. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so let's just do all of them. Cat data 02.txt and pipe that into the same business, cargo, target, dir, slash debug, slash AOC 2019 for day two. And it does seem that we get all the right answers and things are working and our test pass, which they do. Um, and so we're ready to call it a day and commit to GitHub. So git status. Uh, we did modify those files, and we did uh, add those files, git diff. Um, so, this all looks good. That looks good. Git add all, git commit m uh, day two. Oops, sign. Get push. So now all of our code should be up on GitHub uh, for you to look at. And day two is there. And uh, oh, why is day three not there? Uh oh, what happened? What? Oh, I'm in the data folder. Stupid git. Add everything. Oh, how do I do? Okay, so you guys are gonna watch me like fuss with git. Actually, no, I'm just gonna make a new commit. I, I don't know how to revise commits yet in a fast way that I can do on stream. So git commit m day two again. And git push. Ideally, we would sort of revise these, um, but uh, so now day three is there, day two is there, day two has all of our new code in it, everything is hunky-dory, and I am going to sign off. And uh, if, uh, if anybody watches this and wants to provide feedback, I would be more than happy to have it. 
Um, I'm making really long videos and I'm going into a lot of detail, probably unnecessary detail. Uh, I'm not sure if this is helpful or what would be more helpful. So if you have any thoughts about um, how I could be more helpful when I talk and how I code, or if you think the solutions to the problems are silly and they should be fixed in some way, please don't hesitate to reach out um, either in the comments on YouTube or I'll probably sort of make another post to the Rust Reddit subreddit that says, hey, I did day two. Come check it out so you can comment there as well. And uh, yeah, but this has been fun and hopefully it's been um, educational and I will sign off.